Good morning, everyone. I'm Craig Fast. I'm the pastor here at the Wire's Edge. If you're new to us, thank you so much for worshiping with us this morning. We hope that you come back and worship again with us often. We'd love to have you be part of our church family. We believe that you have uh, skills. We believe that you have interests, passions, uh, abilities, resources that will make us a better church, and we want to be a better church. So we just uh, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for all of you who are watching online this morning. Um, put in the comment section about how God is uh, speaking to you and uh, just maybe what the next steps are of what God is asking you to do in your life. And thank you so much for spending part of your morning with us. So we've had some good times at the church. Uh, there's been uh, chili cook-offs that we do every year. Um, there's been two of us who are multiple winners. I won't mention that I'm one of them. So it's kind of like a uh, it's like, you know, like beat Bobby Flay. It's like beat Pastor Craig. And some of you do that once in a while if you get lucky. Um, so we cancel worship um, once a year in August. Uh, don't gather here. We didn't gather at Millard West. We would go out to the community. Uh, hundreds of us would give thousands of hours and tens of thousands of dollars to make Omaha a better place. Those are some fun days. Um, <clears throat> Back in 2011, there was dozens of us that ran a marathon or a half marathon, um, donated about $55,000 to hungry kids in Africa. That was a really fun day. There's uh, Comedy Sundays where this pastor, who's also a wannabe comedian, gets up and makes people laugh for 20 minutes, and we celebrate the joy that, uh, that God gives to us. Just in the last seven days, um, Last Sunday night on the west side of the parking lot, we had over a 1,000 people here, mostly people from the community, mostly kids. Uh, we were able to give them a safe place where they could come and trick-or-treat. Um, it's a place where friendships are formed and communities were built. And just being able to see that from afar, it was like this really cool thing. Tonight, um, we're turning this whole room and the kids' large group area in the lobby into a, a banquet hall. Back in the New Testament day, they would have feasts where People would get together and share God's goodness. That's tonight. Um, 700 people, last I knew, had bought tickets. If you haven't bought a ticket yet, come tonight. There's going to be more than enough turkey uh, for all of us. It's a great way to get to know people. And it supports the youth ministry as they prepare for their mission trips this next summer. Many good times. I could talk forever. Now, uh, this has been... <clears throat> the toughest week in our fairly short history as a church. Um, I did two funerals this week. Um, been staying on the stage way too much. Uh, one was on Tuesday, one was on Friday. Both were people who were younger than me. Holly Sunderman was one of them. Um, she died after a courageous two-year battle with, with cancer. Holly was this beautiful woman. She was confident. There was always a sparkle that was in her eyes. She was a, a loving wife, a dedicated mother. Um, her two sons, one's a sophomore at Millard South, and one's a college football player. He plays in Missouri, and um, she has these wonderful, wonderful parents uh, who are part of our church as well. Now, um, she excelled at her job as secretary at Reagan Elementary School. Um, it didn't matter if the kid was in kindergarten or fifth grade. It didn't matter if the parent that came in was happy or grumpy. Um, I can't imagine she didn't greet every one of them with a smile. You know, she was a ripple creator and uh, a wave maker. You would have saw that if you were here Tuesday. Uh, this room was absolutely full. The doors in the back were open and people were standing. Um, now, Holly and her parents, they started coming earlier this year, but you all totally embraced them as if they have been here our entire history. Um, you, you, uh, you gave us a glimpse of what the church can look like in being the church. Now, the media will tell stories of the church at its worst. You can actually open up the front page of the World Herald, and you can see one today. But what we observed this week was the church at its absolute best, caring for each other, selflessly serving, loving with no strings attached, proclaiming the gospel, um, to a broken and a hurt, hurting world, sharing the promise of God's abundance and the eternal salvation that comes as a gift through the grace of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I 
Now, last Sunday, another of ours died in an accident. Um, Blake McCune was too young to die. Um, he's not only younger than me, he's the age of my 17-year-old high school son. I've known Blake since he was four. Um, I remember him and his twin brother, Nicholas, were in Benjamin's preschool class. His parents, Rusty and Jen, are good friends. I spent five hours with them last Sunday afternoon. Those are five hours that none of us ever wanted to spend together. You know, Blake was Blake. Was Blake. He was this unique, loving, creative, authentic, kind, caring, quirky, and fun kid. He was truly one of a kind, and he embraced that. On Thursday night, we had... Uh, 1,200 people visit and, and say goodbye to him and comfort his family. At one time, I counted there was over 600 people in line. Now, you don't have that many people come unless you're a ripple creator and a wave maker. And Blake was both those. I, was, I, I want to talk about our staff for a moment, our non-clergy staff, and that's everyone except me. Um, during this week, they showed their resolve um, and their dedication to the church and its people. If you get a chance to see them after worship, I encourage you to thank them. They were here early. They, they stayed late. Um, when I was able to finally send out an email on Wednesday when we had all the information, um, we needed 69 volunteers to pull off what we pulled off on Thursday and Friday, and those 69 spots filled up almost instantly. That talks about your commitment to each other, the commitment to Christ and the commitment to his church. And it also honors a young man who died way too soon. This week was life at its absolute worst, but it was also the church at its absolute best. On early Friday morning, I had already been up for a few hours and I needed to go somewhere other than my office and my house, so I got in my car and I came here. I prepared for the rigorous 1.8 mile, four minute commute. Um, and I got stuck at the light on uh, 180th and Harrison, and I looked to my right. And there was a cross the first of three crosses I would see that morning, and this was a cross of a 24-year-old man that grew up in this church as well. A man who was a fighter, a man who overcome, a man who persevered, a man who died way too soon. It was just over three months ago that I was up here at this very place in full of, uh, front of a room full of people saying goodbye to another that died too young. So about 30 to 45 seconds later, I looked to my left and I saw another cross. This was the cross that had been erected since Sunday morning when Blake passed away. Blake and Evan, they actually remind me a lot of each other. Um, ripple creators and wave makers. Charismatic, giving, kind young men who loved life and loved people and passionately loved God. So I got to the parking lot here, and I just couldn't take any more. I finally broke down. I sat in the empty car in a parking lot just south of this room, and I stayed there for a while. I got a lot of messages this week. Thank you for all your support. Um, it's a glimpse of what the families were going to, but just want to thank you for your support. and. I haven't had a chance to respond to many of them yet, but one message I got was really interesting, and it was from a high school girl. Um, and she asked me a question, and the question was this, how do you keep your faith on a week like this? So I looked up at the third cross that I saw that day. <clears throat> a cross that hangs up on this building, a cross that changes colors. I eventually got on my Volvo. I walked into the church, and it was an empty church. Uh, 
I did the same thing I did three months ago. I came into this room, I turned on the lights, and three months ago I hung out with Evan, and two days ago I hung out with Blake. I checked and made sure everything was all right. I prayed. I found a Sunday school room at the end of the hallway. I turned off my phone and did my best to honor a life that was well-lived but too short. Over a 1,000 people came here on Friday. That's how you honor a ripple creator and a wave maker. Our seating capacity in this room is 550 people. Again, the staff and the volunteers exceeded any expectations, and somehow they made it work. Blake's dad, Rusty, and I were emailing a little bit back and forth yesterday, and um, he wanted me to thank the church. When I talked to uh, Kurt Sunderman as he left on Tuesday, he wanted me to thank the church. So here I am. These families, they say thank you. In their darkest, in their toughest, in their most challenging moments, they thank you for being the church. So thank you for caring. Thank you for serving. Thank you for praying. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for giving. Thank you for being their people. It's been a tough week, but this week has been our church at its absolute best. So after the dust settled and the people left and I had some time, I replied to that girl's message. Remember the girl that asked me, how do you keep your faith on weeks like this? Have you ever asked a question of someone and then they ask you a question back and that's like really annoying? That's all I had, that's what I did. Um, It's the best I could do, and it's the best I can still do. And I said, how can you not have faith during days like this? How can you not cling to the cross? How can you not trust the promises? How can you not believe that like, there's something out there that's, that's bigger and greater and grander than any and all of us. Now, it just so happens that faith is on the schedule of what I was supposed to talk about today. We plan these things months in advance, and faith is the topic today. Now, we're in the middle of a series called Create a Ripple. Um, And it's actually a, a yearly series we do on money, and in a way, I was thinking about this this morning. Money just, it did not seem appropriate to talk about today. But then I realized that money is totally appropriate to talk about today because money's not about money. Money is a spiritual thing, and anything of spirituality is something that we need to talk about. You know, the first week during Creative Ripple, we talked about prayer. And we talked about, like, creating ripples in life, and I've talked about two ripple creators and two wave makers these lives that were too young, but these lives that were impactful. So we talked about prayer, and we said that the best ripples are going to be created by our best prayers. So go where your best prayers lead you. One of the things that I said about prayer is that prayer is not us profiting from Christ. Prayer is for us resembling Christ. Now, last week we talked about abundance. Now, if you're sitting in this room today, it means that you live in 2018. It means that you live probably somewhere out here in West Omaha or somewhere similar. It means that there is abundance in your life. The moment we realize that there is abundance in our life is the moment that we can create a ripple, which will eventually become a wave. You know, we talked about um, two things, greed and comparison. Greed in comparison will take us from this place of abundance to scarcity, 
where gratitude and generosity will take us from scarcity to abundance. Now, let's just look back on our history. Um, We could not have done what we did this week. I wish we didn't have to do this week. I wish that this was like the previous seven days were the most boring seven days in the history of the church, but they weren't. It's reality. It's life. It happens. We could not have done what we did without the generosity of the people who have gone before us. You know, so on Sunday night, there was this great big thing going on over there. You know, on Sunday night, there was this really tragic, sad thing going on over there. I think it was probably 6.30 when I left the preschool parking lot. The sun was setting, and the family was leaving, so I left too. And I came here, and an hour later at 7.30, we had uh, a prayer vigil for Blake and his family. This place probably had 250 high school students and another 50 to 75 adults. We had a place that we can go because of the generosity of the people. I remember I, I like when we started, I, I sat right here. I didn't stand, I sat. And I was talking to the kids, and I said, yeah, I don't know what just happened. I don't even remember what I said. Um, the people who were here probably don't remember what I said. You know, then like, you know, I stood up, we sung some songs. Then there was this magical moment, this magical moment, and those of you who were there, like, you could describe this probably 10 times better than me, like, I asked people to, like, you know, share about Blake and the ripples that he created and the waves that he made. And for the next 30 or 40 minutes, we just, like, heard this outpouring of love for a ripple creator and a wave maker. We could not have done this a year ago. It just wouldn't have happened. You know, we couldn't do our funerals with the excellence that we do them. It it would not have happened. We can't have huge gatherings. Um you know, here in this room and other rooms, whether it's a funeral luncheon or a turkey dinner, without the commitment and sacrifice of many of you in this room, you have created a great big ripple. Well, you actually created a little ripple, and it's turned into a great big wave. It has allowed us during our time of need to care for one another. Now, we're doing Create a Ripple. It's a three-year campaign. It starts January 1st, and it ends... um, December 31st of uh, three years later, so 2019 to 2021. And really what we're trying to do is a very spiritual thing. We're trying to reduce or eliminate our debt so that um, we can do more mission and ministry and pay less debt and interest. That's one of the things that we're trying to do. The other is we're trying to put ourselves in a position where we can expand our facilities in the years to come. Like a successful campaign We'll do that. Now, two weeks from today, we're going to turn in our three-year commitment. Some of the families have already turned in theirs. I made an announcement a couple weeks ago that 20 of our families have pledged to give $806,000. That's an average of $40,000 over three years. Um, I'm going to make another announcement next week about uh, some additional families who have given since then. And then also on that day, we're going to... um, pledge to support the budget for 2019. Now, the budget's not a money document. The budget is a vision document. This year, it was about $920,000. Next year, it's going to be over a million dollars. Since March, when we've opened up, our church has grown by over more than 40%. Um, Now, our budget's not growing 40%. Our leaders and our staff have been diligent, and that increase is going to be less than 10%. But both these, uh, you know, we have the opportunity to support them for, for... now and for future generations as well. I just want to say a few things. If you're new, if you're not participating, um, I would just challenge you to take the first step, to be a ripple creator and a wave maker. You know, maybe challenge yourself um, a certain number each week that you'll support the budget with. Now, if you've been around for a while and you practice generosity, thank you. You are making what is happening here at the water's edge possible. You have practiced sacrifice, you have practiced commitment, um, and you've created ripples that have become great big waves. Now, there's also some leaders that have modeled the way of generosity, you've inspired the rest of us, and we just encourage you to keep leading the way and be an example for all of us. 
Now, the reasons that we would talk about money in the church is not the reasons that people would think. The reasons we would do this uh, are fourfold. Number one is something we deal with every day. Uh, the second reason we talk about money is money is something that gives a lot of us some problems. Number three is that uh, Jesus talked about money more than he talked about anything and everything else. And number four, um, it resources and allows us to serve the kingdom here in our slice of the world. Now, money um, is not a financial issue. Money is actually a faith issue. And, and here's why. Um, so Kierkegaard had three stages of faith. Uh, number one is the aesthetic face of faith. And what this is, is like you can say, okay, I, I see the mountains, I, I see the rivers, I watch a movie, I saw the comedian, I listened to the song, I read the book. Um, I've experienced pleasure. And because I've experienced this pleasure, because I have experienced this joy, I believe, yeah, there probably is something bigger and greater than me. Now, that's the first stage. Most of us can get to that point. The second stage is the ethical stage. The ethical means that uh, we finally get to the place where we believe that we are tied to others, we have a responsibility, and we are part of a larger culture. So therefore, we're going to act well and do our part to make our culture better. Now, there's nothing wrong with the ethical. The ethical is good. Many people get to the ethical. But he says the third stage and the final stage of faith is the religious and this is giving ourselves over to something higher than just your role in society. What he would say is that um, faith is the highest pursuit that any of us can ever get to. We will get this far, but we will go no further. So faith is like this then. Faith is uh, taking the next step, even though you don't see the entire end of the destination. Faith is believing um, what you don't see. So Practicing, then, generosity is an act of faith. Let's just say that uh, you're someone who tithes and you believe that the Bible says that we give the first 10% of our income to him and his purposes and he'll bless it. So that's faith. You're actually saying, I believe that I can do more with 90% uh, that is fully blessed than otherwise I could do with 100% on my own that's not blessed. Now, here's how this works. Um, I'll tell you two stories from the Bible. Um, you're not going to get the scriptures this week. Um, I'll be back next week. But this story is from the Gospel of Luke. Um, and so the people are entering the temple, and this one guy comes into the temple, and he's a very wealthy man. So he takes his coins, and he has a lot of coins, and he takes some of those coins, and he, he puts them in the box. And I'm guessing if you're there, like the people can... Um, hear the coins drop in the bottom of the box. And they're looking at this guy, and they're thinking, wow, that is really cool. He's so generous. Um, he's given all that money for God and God's purposes. So then the person that comes after him, um, she's probably an older woman. We know that she's a widow, and we know that she doesn't hardly have any money. In fact, all she has is one coin. So can you imagine, like, what she must have felt like following this person that just gave all this, and it was like this big production, and now probably people are looking at her, and all she has is one little coin. So with humility and with faith, she drops everything that she can into this little basket. It didn't matter if people were thinking, oh, that's all she could give. It didn't matter if people didn't, you know, congratulate her because she didn't, you know, give all this money. She gave what she had. So then Jesus, he went and he found, like, the teachers of the law, um, the people who never made it past the ethical stage, and he says, all right, guys, so uh, here's the deal. Which one of them do you think uh, gave more? Now, at this point, people weren't really responding to Jesus' questions because he kept asking them trick questions. No one could ever get the answer right. Um, so Jesus had to answer it for him, and he says, I tell you truly, the one who gave everything that she had is the one who's most blessed. You know, it wasn't about just giving a little bit from our excess. It was about faith and humility and trust, that I'm going to trust in the creator of this coin more than I'm going to trust in the coin itself. I'm going to trust in uh, God's provision more than I'm going to trust in any provision that I have. 
Then there's another story. Um, so Jesus is preaching one day, and there's a ton of people there. There's 5,000 people there. So Jesus would have started in the morning. We get a clue in the early part of the scripture. And then later in the scripture, it, it, it said it's the day was getting long, which in the Greek would have meant is the, um, is the sun is uh, starting to set. So at this point, Jesus would have been talking for a long time. Can you imagine, like, if I was up here for four hours talking, like, um, well, first of all, none of you would still be here. Um, but that would be like a long sermon, so you're getting hungry after a while. So the disciples, they have the, this little committee meeting, and they go up, and so some of those guys go tell Jesus he's got to be quiet. Um, you know, we're hungry, the people are hungry. So one of them went up, and it's like, uh, Jesus, um, can you just, like, one minute, just one minute? Now, uh, we've greatly appreciate your extensive teaching on basically most of the new te all the old testament this morning and we're wondering the people have uh the people you know they're getting hungry um so maybe we could like take a break and we love the teaching it's awesome like you know if it was us we'd be here all night but it's the people so then jesus is like oh the people are hungry huh yeah yeah the people they're they're hungry um so uh <laughs> jesus looks at him and says all right well you go feed them like, what? Well, you go feed them. You're the one that says they're hungry. So then he goes back, and the 11 others are there, and he says, yeah, we're supposed to feed them. Like, well, there's 5,000 of them, and there's like 12 of us. How is that going to happen? Yeah, I'll go ask Jesus. Um, yeah, we don't know how this is going to work, Jesus. Um, he's like, oh, well, you figure it out. It's your idea. So he goes back. He says, yeah, he told us to figure it out. So they took up a collection. They went to Long John Silver's. Um, they got five biscuits and two filet of fish. They put it in the bag. They went back to Jesus, and they said, all right, this is what we got. And then, like, the miracle happens. You know, they go around, and they, they feed everybody. And there's more than enough food to go around. But what had to happen before the blessing? What happened to happen before the multiplication? There had to be something to multiply. You know, it was just 12 people putting what they had together, putting it in the hands of God and allowing him to do the miracle. Now, you think this is far-fetched. This is not far-fetched. This happens. It's happening right here among us. Yeah, I remember the first person I ever talked to back in 2005 about the water's edge. I asked him if he would give us $10,000 to get started. We didn't have a name yet. I had about three or four people that were affiliated with the movement. And he was in his mid-70s at the time. He's in his mid to late 80s now. And he wrote me out a check for $10,000. That's called Faith. Now, he was here the first day we had a worship service in mid-March, and what he experienced on that day was multiplication. His little bit put into the hands of the Creator becomes a lot. You know, he called me up on Monday morning and said, you know, Craig, um, you got a big week in front of you, and I'm praying for you. you know, we have two of our families um, that were among our 21st givers, the group that has pledged to give $806,000. Two of these families have, during this entire time of the campaign, they will, have, um, they will have six college students among them. Yet the two families together have managed to uh, scrape up $53,000 that they're going to give over three years. Not to me who has complained that I have one college student during this campaign. Um, that's a very inspiring gift that these two families have given. I'll tell you right now that that gift is going to multiply. It gets put in the hands of the creator and allows the church to have the resources to be the best church. You know, I'll, I'll tell you this. It, it takes faith. It takes faith to create a ripple. Now, here's the reason why it takes faith to create a ripple. Because you create a ripple, you're giving out of your abundance you're given something that you have. You're given something that has some value to you. And there is absolutely no guarantee that this ripple will ever become a wave. You may create a ripple and it, it just might fizzle out. You know, that smile that you give to someone, that act of kindness, those encouraging words, that thank you note, 
the financial gift, whatever it is, there is a chance that it will fizzle out, but there's also a chance that it will become a wave. And there is no wave that has ever been created without being a ripple first. So God is leading us to continue to be a church of ripple creators and wave makers. All we got to do is remember uh, Holly and Blake, right? Think about all the smiles that she gave at the school. Think about all the sports teams that she organized, all the ripples that created, and the room was full. People saying thank you to a ripple creator and a wave maker. You know, the kid, like Blake, like, this one's personal to me. Like, he was a ripple creator in my life and the life of my kids. You know, David, the sixth grader, was in a small group, and David absolutely loved Blake. I asked David, I said, tell me about Blake, and he says, Blake tried to make me happy. Blake put a smile on my face. Blake challenged me to be better. That's what a ripple creator does. That's what a wave maker does. You know, my older son went to a different high school. Um, it got a little bit tough for him. Um, he didn't know the kids as well as he used to, and there was always one kid that uh, would come up to him regardless, and it was his preschool buddy, Blake, the ripple creator and the wave maker. You know, I, I pray for us, the church, that um, we become a church, that we become people, that all we do is just create a bunch of ripples, and we put these ripples into the hands of God, and God will do the multiplication, God will do the increase, and we will marvel, we will marvel at these waves of mercy and power and grace and love and faith and hope that God is creating among us. So let's pray. Dear God, I just, right now I pray for, um, for those who have come here this morning and they're hurting Lord, comfort us. Continue to give us the, the gift of each other. Fill us with your presence. Lord, during those times of doubt, give us faith. During those times of anxiety, give us faith. During um, those times when we just hurt, fill us with faith. Lord, help us to continue to take the next step even though we don't see the final destination. Lord, help us to believe where we can't fully see. God, I pray that you comfort us in our loss, that you give us hope for a future. And Lord, we come as people who are grateful. We come as people who are grateful for Jesus Christ, that, that you sent him to the world, that you uh, empowered him and equipped him and inspired him to teach us about abundance, about gratitude, about, about generosity, about healing, about hope, about faith. And God, we also take comfort in the fact that you know what it was like to lose a son. You saw him die a painful death and resurrected him from the dead so that we could experience abundance in this world and eternity in the world to come. So God, Jesus was a ripple creator and a wave maker. And Lord, I pray as we leave this place this morning that you will equip us and empower us and inspire us and give us boldness and courage and in faith to be ripple creators and, and wave makers. God, help us to give to you and trust in your multiplication, to trust in your increase. And Lord, as a community, we just can't wait to see the waves that you're going to create. So Lord, together now in one voice, we come and pray the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hey, just uh, two things. Number one, um, we have a lot of flowers in the front of the church. Now, this is a very small comparison to the number of flowers that we had in the church on Friday. Um, talk to Blake's family, and what they want you to do is uh, come and get some of the flowers. Um, just go give them to someone who could uh, use a ripple or a wave in their life today. You can take them to a fire station. You can take them to someone in your neighborhood that's going through a hard time. You can take them to someone that you know is going through a hard time. You can just take them and give them to a friend and make that friend's life better. That would be a real blessing uh, to the McCune family. And it's going to be a real joy to someone else as well. So come and get the flowers. We don't want any flowers here when we leave today. We do have a prayer team in the back um, right-hand side of the church. Um, they are here willing and wanting to pray with anybody that wants prayer after the worship experience. And I'm going to actually go to the front uh, left-hand side of the church over there. And I'll be uh, just eager to pray with anybody as well today. So have a great uh, Sunday today. Don't forget about the turkey dinner this afternoon tonight. And we'll see you all here next Sunday at the Water's Edge. Mm-hmm.